Acts chapter 10, verses 23 to the end of the chapter. This is God's word. Then, the next, uh, then Peter invited the men into the house to be his guests. The next day, Peter started out with them, and some of the brothers from Joppa went along. The following day, he arrived in Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them and had called together his relatives and close friends. As Peter entered the house, Cornelius met him and fell at his feet in reverence. But Peter made him get up. Stand up, he said. I am only a man myself. Talking with him, Peter went inside and found a large gathering of people. He said to them, you are well aware that it is against our law for a Jew to associate with a Gentile or visit him. But God has shown me that I should not call any man impure or unclean. So when I was sent for, I came without raising any objection. May I ask why you sent for me? Cornelius answered, four days ago, I was in my house praying at this hour at three in the afternoon. Suddenly a man in shining clothes stood before me and said, Cornelius, God has heard your prayer and remembered your gifts to the poor. Send to Joppa for Simon, who is called Peter. He is a guest in the home of Simon the Tanner, who lives by the sea. So I sent for you immediately, and it was good of you to come. Now we are all here in the presence of God to listen to everything the Lord has commanded you to tell us. Then Peter began to speak. I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts men from every nation who fear him and do what is right. You know the message God sent to the people of Israel telling the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. You know what happened, what has happened throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee after the baptism John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil because God was with him. We are witnesses of everything he did in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They killed him by hanging him on a tree. But God raised him from the dead on the third day and caused him to be seen. He was not seen by all the people, but by witnesses whom God had already chosen, by us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and testify that he is the one whom God appointed as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him, that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles, for they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. Then Peter said, can anyone keep these people from being baptized with water? They have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. So he ordered that they be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked Peter to stay with them for a few days. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, as we come to your word, we, we do ask that the Holy Spirit would illuminate uh, it to us, that we would understand what you have written down for uh, your glory and our good, that we would conform our lives to it by the power of your Holy Spirit, seeking more of your grace and strength and not trying to do this on our own. And Lord, we pray that these things might be so in order that the gospel might go to all the earth. For we desire to be instruments in your hand. We desire to be your active servants in the proclamation of Jesus Christ fulfilling the Great Commission. That the gospel was not just for Jerusalem or Judea, but also for Samaria and even to the very ends of the earth. And so we pray, Father, that you would bless us now in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as we come and return to our text, I want to just remind you that where we began by saying that chapter 10, although somewhat lengthy, is uh, fairly easily divided uh, and one way to look at this is that Peter uh, is given a vision, but so is Cornelius. So there are two visions, and then we also have two journeys. We have the journey to Peter, 
And then we have the journey with Peter back to Cornelius. Two visions, two journeys, but one gospel message. And that's the wonderful thing as we look today. We're going to be looking at the gospel message that Peter, that Peter proclaimed. The, the, the message that the angel told Cornelius he should send to Joppa to receive. The message of the good news, the message of life, the message of Jesus Christ. And then also at the end of this particular incident, we have not two people anymore, but one people of God. One church of Jesus Christ, Jew and Gentile, together. So let's begin by just remembering uh, that the vision that Peter had was a vision that was perplexing at the time. If you look back at verse 17 in chapter 10, you'll see that Peter was wondering exactly what this meant. He wasn't clear about what God was trying to teach him, but at that time, and here we come to the first journey. The men that Cornelius had sent found out where Simon's house was and stopped at the gate. They no doubt called out. Perhaps they knocked, but they didn't ring a doorbell or send a text, I'm sorry to say. But they got the attention of those who were in the house, and they said, is this where Peter is? Is this where Simon called Peter lives? And they found out that it was, and it was at that time after Peter had come out from this trance perplexed as, what, as to what it was meant and still thinking, verse 19, about what he had seen, about what God had shown to him, that the Holy Spirit comes and speaks. Now, this is a wonderful principle, right, in and of itself, that we shouldn't just rely on dreams or visions or intuitions. We shouldn't just think that we can understand all the things that God is teaching us ourselves. We need, number one, the Holy Spirit. We need the Holy Spirit, which is why we have a prayer of illumination, why we pray that God would bless both the reading and the preaching of His Word, because apart from the Holy Spirit's work in our hearts and minds, this will be like water off a duck's back. It'll come and it'll go in one ear and out the other and make no difference whatsoever for living or for God or for others. But by God's grace, the Holy Spirit here speaks to Peter and says to him, Simon, three men are looking for you. Get up and go downstairs. Our text says, do not hesitate to go with them. But the Greek could also be read, do not discriminate amongst them. In other words, go and see these as clean, not as unclean. I have uh, just shown you this sheet held by the four corners, let down from heaven with all kinds of animals and birds and reptiles and told you that what God has cle made clean, do not call them unclean. And here are three men. Go with them. And so Peter goes down and says, I'm the one you're looking for. What can I do for you? And they tell him that they've been sent. They've been sent in obedience by Cornelius to the angel's message. The angel was there and, and, and indicated to Cornelius that God would, has heard him, has heard his prayers, has seen his, his righteous acts done in the fear of the Lord, but that he needed the gospel. And so go, get Simon called Peter, and he will be the one to bring the message. Not the angel, but Peter an earthen vessel will bring the message of salvation to your house. And so they go. The next day, verse 23, Peter starts out with them. And some of the brothers from Joppa went along. Now, why is this important? Why does Luke mention it? And why do we need to notice it? Well, it's important because Peter, although he was an apostle, was one apostle. You remember, if you will, back just a little earlier in Acts, when the gospel went to, the, to Samaria and the Samaritans received it and the Holy Spirit came upon them, that two apostles were sent to confirm that work of the Lord. Peter went, but so did John. Peter's now by himself in Caesarea at Joppa. And so he goes, but he doesn't go by himself. He takes along these brothers. Other Jews who also believed in Jesus as their Lord and Savior went with Peter, went with him to help him, went with him wondering, I'm sure, what was going on. And as they arrive, we see a beautiful thing. They arrive and Cornelius was expecting them. But he wasn't just waiting for them, was he? It wasn't just Cornelius who was there, was it? 
Who else was there? Cornelius was expecting them and had called together his relatives and close friends. Cornelius was so sure that this message of the Lord was for their good that he says, I can't, I can't just keep it to myself. Come along. Come hear this with me. Fathers, mothers, brothers, sisters, aunts, uncles, cousins, nephews, nieces, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, servants, other soldiers, come hear this message of the Lord. I wonder sometimes if we get that excited about the preaching of the gospel. If we get that excited about hearing a word from the Lord. Now perhaps we would if someone came to you and said, I have a secret word of the Lord for you. Would we want to know what it is? Probably curiosity would compel us to go and say, I wonder what they're going to say. But this gospel, this good news isn't a secret. It's to be proclaimed from the rooftops. And we, as, I, as we've already mentioned in prayer, have a, a wonderful amount of freedom today to gather to hear this gospel message proclaimed. I wonder, I wonder if perhaps God as he works in our hearts and lives, and as we pray for revival, might allow us this kind of expectation too, where we're so expectant about what God will say. We're so excited to hear what he has to say that we make the phone call, we invite people in, we bring them over, we bring them with us, and we say, this is the word of the Lord, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Look over at verse 33, if you would, please, just again an indication of how Cornelius saw this visit, how he thought of what was going on. He says to Peter, when asked why he was there, he said, so I sent for you immediately, and it was good of you to come. Now we are all here, not just in my house, not just before you, Peter, but we are all here in the presence of God to listen to everything the Lord has commanded you to tell us. Friends, this is the attitude with which we ought to come to worship every Sunday. This is how we ought to be here today. We are here expecting God to speak to us because we are in his presence. We're in his presence not because we meet in a church building. We're in his presence not because we dressed the right way. We're in his presence not because we're Presbyterian. We're in his presence because the gospel is being proclaimed and Jesus Christ is being worshiped. We're in his presence because he is the God who meets with us, who comes near to us. And to whom does he come near? As we come to the message that Peter brings, notice how he begins. He begins, first of all, with uh, rejecting the adoration of mankind. He begins in verse 25 and 6 by saying to Cornelius, I am only a man like you. Get up. This is undue reverence. Now, this is important for us. Why? Because, number one, we see in our culture a celebrity culture. We see that people want to be, have the fame and be well known. Even if it's just 15 minutes of fame, it seems to be one of the driving motivations in our culture today that we get to be known, even if it's just as a YouTube sensation. And pastors face the same temptations sometimes, don't they? They want to be well-known. They want the accolades. They want people to be referring to them with some sort of reverence. And it's striking that the apostles, particularly the 12 apostles that God himself, that's including Matthias, we saw in the beginning of Acts, was chosen by Lot by the other apostles after Judas Iscariot went astray. But the 12 apostles who were commissioned specifically to take the gospel to the ends of the world, that we know very little about them, that they are not as well known. We know about Peter. We know about Paul, the apostle to the Gentile. But we don't pray to them. At least we ought not to pray to them. We don't adore them or venerate them. At least we ought not to. It is Jesus Christ alone who is worthy of our worship, not angels, not any other creature. Stand up, he says. I am only a man myself. This is how he begins, but then he goes inside and he says something else very important. He says to them, you are well aware that it is against our law for a Jew to associate with a Gentile or even visit him. 
It's against our law. And when he says that, he's talking about the, the, the law of the land, the customs of the Jews at this time was that you could not even visit a Gentile. They were so unclean that if you went into their house, if you shared table fellowship with them, if you had a meal with them, that you yourself would then be unclean, unfit for God, unfit for his service or his worship. It's against our law for a Jew to even associate with a Gentile or visit him. But God has shown me that I should not call any man impure or unclean. God has broken down these barriers. God has done away with these prejudices. God has done away with this favoritism. And he says it again after he begins preaching. He says in verse 34, now I realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism. I'm so glad he said that because we're a fairly homogenous church, not totally by the grace of God, but fairly homogenous church. And yet we know that prejudices are wrong. We don't want to be racist. At least I hope we don't. We ought not to. We don't want to be bigoted. We don't want to show the kind of prejudice in our daily lives. What we know is wrong, and rightly so. But favoritism, that puts a little different nuance on it, doesn't it? Because we all have our favorites. We all have those things that we're more comfortable with and we would rather people act that way because they make us more comfortable. Well, God is a God who doesn't play favorites, doesn't show favoritism in this way either. He doesn't allow these things to, to hold back the proclamation of the gospel. All who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and call upon him for salvation will be saved. Everyone can have their sins forgiven. It doesn't matter who you are, where you come from. And Peter is there in this place this very day to proclaim this gospel for the world, a gospel for all nations. But what is the gospel that Peter proclaims? He says after verse 36, he says, verse 36, you know the message God sent to the people of Israel telling the good news of peace. This is the gospel we proclaim, a gospel of peace. Peace among whom? Peace between two warring parties. Who are these warring parties? The warring party is the sinner and a righteous God. Have you ever thought about that? Have you ever thought that God is your enemy outside of Christ? That he looks upon you as his enemy outside of Christ? That's not very PC, I wouldn't say. It's not very, and that's not a very happy story, but it's completely biblical. Apart from Christ, we are rebels. We are God's enemies. Our hearts are in rebellion against his rule, and we don't want to have anything to do with him if we can help it. But in Christ, we have been reconciled. In Christ, we have peace with God because he has taken away our sin and rebellion and given us new hearts. In Christ, we have his righteousness covering us so that we can enter into his very presence and come before him with thanksgiving. In Christ, we have not only peace with God, but we have the peace of God, a peace that no other religion and no other, no other anything can give to us, a peace that allows us to live in this broken, fallen world without being undone. This is the gospel, this is the message, the good news Peter talks about. It's a message of peace, the good news of peace, but it's peace through Jesus Christ. It's peace through a person, through God himself who has become a human being. It's not peace through religious observance. It's not peace through a, a, a denying of self in a, in, a, in a way that says, look how much I've given up for you. It's peace through Jesus Christ, who he is and what he's done, who is Lord of all. Jesus Christ is Lord of all. Now, when we think of proclaiming the gospel, uh, what do we think of? Sometimes we think of sharing our faith, our testimony, and that's, that's an important part of what we do. We show and share how the Lord has changed us, how we're different than before, how we love the things of God now because of his grace and work in our hearts and lives. And it can be an attractive way of telling people that Jesus Christ has made a personal difference in my life. 
But that's not the gospel. When we share our testimony, we share what the gospel has done for us, but it's not the gospel. Sometimes, as R.C. Sproul says, we can say to people, I've got good news for you, God loves you. It is good news, Sproul says, but it's not the gospel. So what is the gospel? In New Testament categories, the gospel is understood in terms of a definite content, and that content is not about me, and it's not really about you either. The content focuses attention on the person and work of Christ, who he is and what he has done. So the question for us today, this morning, is do you know the gospel? Do you know the content of the good news? Do you know the person and work of Jesus Christ? As we look at what Peter says, we see that that's where his focus is. His focus is on Jesus, the person and work of Jesus. Look with me and just let's trace how how Peter gives this chronological gospel presentation. Beginning in verse 37, he says to Cornelius, a God-fearer but a Gentile, you know what has happened throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee after the baptism that John preached. What Jesus had done in this, in time and space, was so well known that 100 miles away, Peter could say to someone who wasn't a Jew, you know what, what has happened. You know what has happened throughout the land, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power. This was his baptism, the beginning of his public ministry, and how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil. It wasn't just that he did performed miraculous healings. It wasn't just that he went around making people feel good physically healing them of their blindness or of their lameness or of their deafness. It was he did this as an inbreaking of the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God had come and had come in power and they were under the power of those who were under the power of the devil, Jesus Christ freed. This was the work of Jesus Christ, the minister, the ministry of Jesus while he was on earth showing the healing that was to come spiritually because they were under the power of the devil and pointing to how he brings wholeness in all of life. This was his earthly ministry to do this. And then Peter goes on to talk about his death. We are witnesses of everything he did. And here's one of the things that the Jews did to him. They killed him by hanging him on a tree. Again, it's interesting that they come to, to Cornelius, who is a Gentile, and there's references to the Old Testament. There's references to the work of Jesus Christ while he was here on earth. Hanging him on a tree refers to Deuteronomy and the curse that was associated with being hung on a tree. He didn't just say they killed him by crucifying him. Even though he was talking to a centurion, he says it this way. They killed him by hanging him on a tree. Without the cross, we have no gospel. The cross of Jesus Christ is central to the message for the Christian. They killed him by hanging him on a tree, but God raised him from the dead on the third day and caused him to be seen. So we have the, the life of Jesus. We have the death of Jesus. We have the resurrection of Jesus. And then what we hear are the, the, the witnesses that testify to the truth of this. These are eyewitnesses, but they don't stop just with the eyewitnesses of the resurrection. It goes on in verse 42 to say, He commanded us to preach to the people and testify that He is the one whom God appointed as judge. So we have the, the baptism of Jesus and His earthly ministry. We have His death. We have his resurrection, but Peter includes in this gospel presentation the truth that Jesus Christ is judge of the living and the dead. Again, what is the gospel? It's a gospel of peace through Jesus Christ. We are all enemies of God outside of Jesus Christ. And there will be a day of judgment for both the living and the dead. And Jesus is the judge of the living and the dead. Far better to come and stand before the judge who has died for you and reconciled you to the Father and given you no, new life, eternal life, than to stand before the judge as his enemy. 
Peter gives this gospel presentation, proclaiming the person and work of Jesus Christ. And before he can go any further, talking about the benefits of salvation or how to receive these benefits even, God interrupts him. Isn't it wonderful when God interrupts? I don't know if you've ever had that experience when you've been going through your daily life and all of a sudden it's as if God says, nope, I have a different plan for you today. You know, you're not going to do what you thought you might do. I want you to do this or that or the other thing. I've never had that happen when I'm preaching. You guys might pray that it happens sometime when I'm preaching. Because this is what happened when God interrupts Peter's preaching. The Holy Spirit falls in power upon the people who are listening. The Holy Spirit, the third person of the Godhead, God himself comes down that day. What a glorious interruption that is. Peter didn't even have a chance to give an invitation. Didn't even have a chance to wrap up or cite the Old Testament that he seems about to do when he says all the prophets. While he was still preaching, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. What was that message again? Oh yes, it was the gospel, the good news of peace through Jesus Christ who is the Lord of all. What is the gospel? It's the person and work of Jesus Christ, and it's the truth that everyone who believes in him, everyone, no, no favorites, Jew or Gentile, everyone who believes on him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. And the Holy Spirit comes down, and the people who are with Peter are astounded because they didn't expect it. It's wonderful when God interrupts our day as long as we can understand that he's interrupting it so that we can be a blessing to others or that he could bless others through us perhaps would be a better way of saying it. But isn't it also wonderful when he astonishes us? When he brings to himself from his sovereign grace people that we would never expect to be saved. And we can say, wow, Look at the glorious grace of God who saved such a sinner. I want you to look at me and see that. You may have looked at me for a number of years now or had in your mind that, well, the pastor, of course God saved him. He's a good guy. He knows his Bible. In fact, he was raised in a pastor's home. He said, oh, if anybody would be saved, it would be him. It's not true. It's not true. You're looking at a rebel, an enemy of God, one who wants to be autonomous, one who still struggles with selfishness. You are looking at a trophy of the grace of God because it is only by grace that I'm here today. It's only by grace that we are saved, any one of us. When I look at you, I see trophies of God's grace. Who are you, who am I, to deserve these things? We don't deserve these things. None of us do. Most of us in the Christian church in America today are not people of Abraham by the flesh. But we are children of Abraham by faith. And that faith is a gift of God, lest any one of us should boast. But we tend to boast. Peter's gospel presentation is meant to expose the glorious grace of God in saving Gentiles. But we so often read these words and say, that's wonderful, and forget that we also are Gentiles, and that this gospel is for us too, and that this is the message that we are to take to the world. Peter, the forefront of bringing the gospel to the nations, but today, June 12th, 2016, we are on the forefront as well of taking the gospel to the nations. 
And the question is, will we? Will we be like Peter, one people who know the gospel because we know Jesus Christ? And knowing Jesus Christ, we want others to know him too. And so we'll go where God sends us, even if we're not particularly sure why we're there. Isn't that a wonderful aspect of the story when Peter in verse 29 says, may I ask why you sent me? I'm here. Why am I here? Maybe you'll find yourself like that somewhere this week. Maybe you'll find yourself with unexpected car trouble and you'll be sitting in the, in the car repair shop and say, God, why am I here? Well, maybe, maybe it's an opportunity to share the gospel, not just your testimony, not just the good news that, G that God loves you, but the message of Jesus Christ, who he is and what he's done so that others, by God's grace, might be saved as well. Here we see that we too often play favorites. The challenge for us is to see that and wonder and ask God's forgiveness. For when we look around at others and say they don't deserve to know Jesus Christ, we don't want them in our church. The story is told by our Kent Hughes that Mahatma Gandhi, that name will be familiar to most of you, I trust. Mahatma Gandhi, while in England during his study, time as a student, was interested in Christianity. He read the Gospels and actually thought that maybe this was a good thing. He went to a church one Sunday morning intending to ask the minister questions about salvation, about the Gospel, about Jesus. But at the door, an usher turned him away and said, you should go worship with others like you. Mahatma Gandhi left that church, and he said, if they have trouble with caste system too, then I'll just stay a Hindu. And so he did. Who do we look at and say, you should go with your own people? We don't really, we don't really want you here. Well, there's a challenge to us here, isn't there? A challenge not to wait for the world to come for us, to us. A challenge not just to be welcoming people. A church that is friendly. A church that says, come on, we'll make you feel at home. We'll love you when you get here. But rather, to be those that understand that the dividing wall between Jew and Gentile has been broken down and that the gospel is to go to all nations. And as one writer has said it, we're to crawl over the rubble to get to them. We're to count the cost, but we are to pay the price. Dennis Johnson says this, we cannot wait for non-Christians to cross the cultural gaps, to scale the walls, to get to know us well enough to see Christ's grace in our lives. The gospel speaks with power in every culture to every people under heaven. When the gospel touches a new culture, it does not leave that culture unchanged. Yet God does not demand that people leave their culture in order to hear of his grace in Christ. We who have experienced this grace are the ones who must climb the walls, build the bridges, and suffer the stresses of culture shock. People who know Jesus must pay the price to pierce the barriers between people's and as they do, Jesus spreads his salvation to the ends of the earth. Where is the ends of the earth? Where do we need to go? There's a sense in which we can say we are at the ends of the earth. The question is, I think, for us, will we take the gospel as we go out into the world? Will we take Christ? to the world, to the nations. May it be so for God's glory and for their good. For the way of Jesus Christ is the only way of salvation and there is no other name under heaven or earth by which we may be saved. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we ask that the, the absoluteness and exclusiveness of your claim in Scripture would pierce our hearts afresh. 
that we might see once again the, the, the treasure that you have given us. And it's a treasure not to be hoarded, but to be shared. And we'd see the person and work of Jesus with new clarity, understanding that he is the only Savior. But he is a Savior for all. Certainly not just for people like us. And so we pray, Lord, that you would, would send us out from this place with a new understanding, a, a new zeal, a greater dependence on you, yes, but a, a greater love for Christ, that as we go, we would spread the good news. And that when we return, when we come and hear God's word, that we would gather others with us in expectation of hearing words of life from your book. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.